All right, all right. So, recently I was sent a video by a friend of mine, uh, and I haven't done any personal research on this, so, you know, like, let's go ahead and just basically hop in this. I'm going to be turning off my camera, so you don't have to see me be, like, a weirdo while I eat, so, yeah. The standard thing is I'm really pleased to be here, etc. I'm really pleased to be here for deeply instrumental reasons, which is the following. Um, so Alan was just asking me about what I've been writing, and I talked talk about one book. But there's another one. I actually got money from Soros to do something. So I'm looking forward to putting out the following tweet that says, I am fully in the pay of George Soros. <laughs> tweet number two, the pay's not that good. <laughs> tweet number three, certainly not enough to replace you all with minorities. Ooh, is that funny? Is that fun? It's almost funny. It's almost it's just like you know, it could appeal to different constituencies. That one, you can see how it goes. Um, so the project that I got cash for is called R for Everyone. What? It's wind that back around a little bit. I'm very confused. Well, Alan was just asking me about what I've been writing, and I talk, talked about one book. But there's another one. I actually got money from Soros to do something. So I'm looking forward to putting out the following tweet that says, I am fully in the pay of George Soros. <laughs> tweet number two, the pay's not that good. <laughs> tweet number three, certainly not enough to replace you all with minorities. What? What? I... Is this guy just like... Okay. Seems like a really weird statement to make. It's pretty cringe. Ooh, is that funny? Is that fun? it's almost funny? It's almost, it's just like, you know, it could appeal to different constituencies, that one. You can see how it goes. Um, so the project that I got cash for is called R for Everyone. Now, I'm not the first person to think about this. In fact, there are people here who have thought about this a great deal. And that's kind of why I wanted to come. Because I need a primer and all this stuff, and you lot are going to give it to me, which is great. Um, so basically the argument is, as you can probably guess, Piketty's R is greater than G. If the rate of return on G is either low or horribly skewed, why not focus on R? Because R basically has a 6% compound and across different asset classes, so it makes much more sense to give the 80% a 6% real return, rather than saying, why don't you save up a bit and stop buying avocados? Because that's just facetious and useless. Um, speaking of facetious and useless, we'll get started. Oh. That's yeah, facetious and useless. <laughs> I mean, really, how on earth did we end up here? I mean, that's happening in real time now. He's going to be the Prime Minister of Britain. It's just, what the f is going on? And of course, you know, the real puzzle for this one of, uh, is, you know, you can think what you like about Europe. You can, I'm, I'm a reasonable fan of the political project and a horrible critic of the monetary project, and you can have various positions on this. But the problem with Brexit, if you think about it, is it makes no sense because the Brits had the best deal ever, right? Exactly as it says there, they have this huge financial system that clears euros. Their currency sits as a unique little hedge between the dollar and the euro. They make tons of cash off of this. They're, other things I can put in there, they're the largest money launderers in the world through their property markets. Um, they get to veto whatever they didn't want, all the rest of it. You get free market access set for 60% of your exports. And you were never going to join the euro, right? That was the key thing. So all the strictures of the fiscal compact and the semester and all that, none of that applied to these guys. So they had the best deal ever and David Cameron decided to go negotiate a better deal than the best deal ever and consequently had to have a referendum about it, which then they lost. So, you know, this is sort of really deserves to be explained. Um, this is my favorite little slide, of course. That was the exit poll at 6 p.m. That was what was meant to happen. That's how badly wrong we were in that case. And this is the take home on this, which is they're not going anywhere. The shitty James Bond villain at the top is, of course, exactly the, the Dutch populist, the Le Pen family business. The German elections. Of course, it's interesting now that the great. What, what I noticed on this one actually when it came out is if you add together the left and the Greens, it's way bigger than the AFD. And the AFD's vote share has actually stalled, and the Greens are now the biggest single party in Germany. So there's an interesting thing here, which is there is a left populism, which we're rather blind to. We just don't want to acknowledge it's the same phenomenon. 
but it's there and it's just as powerful. And of course, this is the Italian elections and what you've got now. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Hold on. You're just throwing that out and you're not going into details? Like, come on. Detail. The reason why. I don't feel like just briefly skipping over something is going to be that. And if it's brief, if it's stalled in the AFD, then you need to show those statistics itself. Wait. You can show, like, statistics how it is, but, like, if it's changed, then shouldn't you update your slides so you can be more able to accurately represent the reality? I, I feel like that's something important to cover. Now is the decline of Five Star and the consolidation of La Lega, but there are lots of other examples. So, very simple. Oh, by the way, don't bother coming on Wednesday, because I'm going to be doing the same shit again, right? So you're getting it now. You're fine. Don't, don't do it, boys. Um, so... Try and explain all this to people with how this happened when you're kind of a, a, a global macro person. I came up with this analogy, uh, and it's more than an analogy because one way of thinking about capitalist systems is that they are information processing devices. They are actually computers on a certain level. But I also mean this in a, in a slightly different sense. So if you take this Apple laptop, if somebody had something different than an Apple, in university, there's a monoculture, all you ever have are apples. Some people have other types of computers. If you drop them on the floor and you let them break into pieces, you, what you find is that there's all the same components, but they're all arranged slightly differently. So they've all got a motherboard, they've all got a processor, a memory, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. And capitalist economies are essentially very similar to this, in that market institutions are ubiquitous, but universal, but also very similar. So okay. the Americans have a labor market, it's enormous. It's highly flexible and highly restricted, depending on which bit you look at. The German... Depends on how you interpret flexible and able to, like, adapt and stuff. Like, I think a good, like, proportion of our market is uh, revolving around service industry as it is. In that instance, like, the service is basically the same thing. It's just the appearance, like, has some different mechanisms, like... You have the service of, like, cleaning, you have the service of, like, cashiers, you have the service of, like, customer representatives, like, all the functions of, like, stores and all that stuff, like, fall down to the same roughly similar thing, so I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good argument. Although, I don't know how I feel about this guy yet. He's, he's a bit of a mixed bag. He's got some good potential, but... I also feel like there are some things that he's glossing over that I want him to go more into detail. But this is only four minutes, you know, maybe. Uh, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Labor market is very, very different. Germans have a capital market, but 50% of their firms don't list on any exchanges. Most of it comes through retained earnings, and there's still very high family ownership of businesses. So these things are different at the level of hardware, even if ultimately what they're doing, the information processing task is the same. That being said, the way that I think about economic ideas, something that I've written a lot about, is that's the software that runs the system. And an interesting way to think about it is if you have the institutions of Swedish social democracy circa 1970, with Rand Meidner institutions and wage earners funds, you simply cannot put American libertarian software on top of that and run it. Right? You can't do that, does it? I, th I don't think the argument, and you can just put it on top of it. I think the argument of introducing Nordic models is that there are fundamentally key components of the Nordic model that basically um, there are key components of the Nordic model that are effective and useful and like in significant ways preferable. Like healthcare is a pretty big one. And that instance is yes. If you're going to adapt these mechanisms, institutions, and ideas to the, like, American systems, then you're going to have to have an alteration to some extent. And it's not going to be a perfect representation. Like, if you look at, like, if you're making the computer analogy, like, you start off with, like, the base hardware system, right? And from there is you can uh, adapt it, uh, change it, and uh, adjust it. And there are going to be significant differences, say, as opposed to, like, where those are, those are, uh, new pieces come from but at the same time it's still going to hold those ins those pieces together and work within those pieces so i th i don't i don't think that's necessarily a good comparison here that there's an execution error it's not going to work 
So with that in mind, with market institutions of the hardware, economic days of the software, how did we get here is a very long story. So I want to talk about three computers on a global macro sense. The one that basically solved the information problem for the period from 1870 to World War I. Uh, why there was no one between basically World War I and World War II. What happens after World War II, version 2.0, and then what happens in the 1980s till 2008, which is a telling date for version 3.0. So the first one's the gold standard. So I've got here policy target. What I really mean by that is, what's the problem to be solved? And the problem to be solved is capital mobility without inflation. The basic problem of the gold standard with open capital accounts and current accounts is you've got a world where for the first time steamships and other technological advances make global trade possible on a scale you haven't seen before. A great example of this is Argentina. Argentina was worthless until about the 1870s when steamships could reach them, the pampas could be opened up to cattle, and then you could slaughter them on site and then basically export them to the core and the leading families in Argentina. So who is determining the worthlessness here? Because, um, here, give me a second. I'm going to look up something. He said the 1870s, right? Economic history of Argentina. Argentina, which had been insignificant during the first half of the 19th century, showed growth until it was so impressive that it was expected to eventually become the United States of the South America. Okay. It was driven by the export of agricultural goods. A 2018 study describes Argentina as super exporter during the period 1880-1929 and credits the boom to low trade costs and trade liberalization on one hand. All right. In the second half, there is an intense process of colonization of the territory in the form of Latifundia. Did it already have independence? Okay, so it had independence, and then it independently developed its economy. I, I am assuming. There's probably some significant foreign influence to some extent, but it seems like it, it's, it was independent. It became independent in 1810, but who, who had uh, previously controlled it? Colonial economy, Spanish Empire. Okay, so the Sp so Spain controlled it, and then it eventually became independent, and then it began to develop its own economy, and then from there it created like uh, levels of colonization. Let me see. Argent uh, export led boom. There's during the second half. There's intense process of colonization of the territory. The ter and the the very expensive parcel, parcel, parcel of privately owned land. La Latifundia, Roman history. Okay, ancient Rome, Europe, Spain. All right. Okay. So it had some economic depend dependence, and then from there it was being controlled to some extent. Made an absolute killing, which retained its structure all the way through the 1930s and eventually brought in Peronism, a form of populism. Right. So the problem to be solved there is if I swap real goods for bits of paper, how do I know that the good bits of paper have anything backing them? Such that you're not just handing me bits of paper. And when I try and buy something else with those bits of paper, it turns out they're just bits of paper. So it needs to be backed by gold. It has to have something there that limits the supply of that currency because otherwise there's, devalue, there's inflation and thus the destruction of the value of the currency. Then the mechanism to do this is open capital and current accounts. Basically, money flows in, money flows out, and goods and services are exchanged. And the main mechanism of adjustment becomes wages. That is to say, wages inflate or deflate depending on where you are in terms of the trade cycle and the financial cycle. So basically... I mean, wages are also going to be artificially manipulated. Like, businesses themselves are going to purposely, like, like to some extent, like, uh, like the value of a product is going to determine the product value of a wage, but there's also the instance that uh, companies themselves are also going to artificially affect those statistics and uh, like affect um the val the fact uh, the ar like artificially create a value of the wage itself. They're basically going to try to pay them the least amount possible so they can extract the most amount of wealth possible. So. 
I don't think it's necessarily a fair argument to say that wages are going to naturally adjust. There's a lot of like interference by companies and corporations and such that are going to make it difficult to accurately represent the value of a wage. They, you, you all know this, right? I, do I need to explain this? Do I need to explain how this works? Yeah. All right. So imagine there's two economies in the world, just two. So you've got the the Germans. Let's say it's the Germans and the Americans. One of them makes Apple computers. One of them makes BMWs. So the Americans decide to go on a tear and buy nothing but BMWs. Well, when they do that, the Germans are exporting capital, uh, exporting goods through the current account. We are importing them. But the correspondence for that is the capital account has to shift out money. And as you pay for that, what's happening is your gold supply goes down. As your gold supply goes down, what happens to you? The money supply, it contracts. So your money supply contracts at the same time as you're importing more. What's going to happen to wages? They've got to fall to the accommodated money supply. Conversely, the Germans are importing bits of paper. Now, they can use that to buy other stuff, but more importantly, their gold supply is going up, which means that they're basically inflating their money supply, which means there's more money for wages, which means people consume more. When they consume more, what do they do? They buy Apple computers. So the process reverses itself. So there's what was called the automaticity of the gold standard. Now, in theory, this is great, but the only thing is the mechanism of adjustment is domestic wages and prices. If this happens slowly, then that's fine. But if this happens abruptly and regularly, you get a lot of volatility in the system, which is very disruptive for basically people's lives. So okay. Mark told line about, you know. All right, all right, all right. I think he, I'm kind of liking this guy. He's not bad so far. He's not bad. I'm curious where he's going to take this. Because I have a strong feeling so far um, that basically he's going to say, uh, yo, like, like, yeah, this is going to disrupt people's lives. I don't know. I don't know how he's going to take this. I don't know where he's going to go. I'd be curious to see. And the, the sack of potatoes, you can rework it to a sack of potatoes doesn't care what it costs. But a bunch of people who work in an export sector, you're employed, you're unemployed, you're replaced by Irish, you're unemployed. That's high volatility in the system. So governance is a minimalist night watchman, watchman state plus extreme violence for, for the periphery. That's pretty much the governance mechanism. All right. All right. Pretty based. Pretty based. I like I like it. I like it. You know, like... Uh... The idea is to have the corporations basically run their own governments like the Hoovervilles and stuff and basically control the workers and enact violence. All right. He's on a good track so far. I got a good, I got a good, I got a good feeling about this guy. Now, what does this lead to? Heterogeneous national economies. Argentina does beef. Right? Britain does finance and violence. The Germans play catch up, right? Pick who you want to be. Finance and violence. All right. Well, I mean, sure, their their exports and products are going to be significantly different, but the mechanisms themselves are going to be pretty homogenous. I think. Like, for example, significant places that are exporters, importers, like in non-independent nations, are significantly going to have uh, different like colonies and. Co uh, controlled areas where they hold like the basic same mechanisms institutions so I think that's a little bit of a misrepresentation but I don't think it's necessarily a bad one it's like heterogeneous at the extent of different products sure but like the mechanisms are pretty similar <coughs> Canada does whatever Canada did I was never sure <coughs> we call this basically globalization 1.0 that's a profit led growth model and what I mean by that is that there is no attempt to use fiscal instruments to compensate for the cycle. It's all that the long run rate of growth is determined basically by supply side factors through profits for firms. Mm, uh, yeah, I, I would agree generally that infinite, uh, governmental institutions weren't really as involved at this stage, really, except to like police through a police state and such, but. Yeah, I think I generally agree with that. Free trade and free, free financial flows, flexible labor markets, very low taxes to the extent that they exist at all, very low transfers amongst the population. So what's computer two? What do we mean by a transfer exactly? Economics. A transfer.
In macro and finance, a uh, transfer payment is a redistribution of wealth, income, and wealth by the means of the government making a payment without goods or service being received in turn. Alright, so where the, you have less government interference, okay. Yeah, I generally agree with that. Well, it doesn't appear until 45 to 80, and the policy targets full employment. The problem would be solved is employment or unemployment. And why is that? Well, we'll go through why, but when Computer 1.0 crashed, the lesson that was learned was everybody has to get a job all the time or we're doomed. Because that was the lesson of the Great Depression, fascism, and the turn, to the turn towards communism in Europe. Let's wind this back around a little bit. I am fuzzled slightly. Computer 2. Well, it doesn't appear until 45 to 80, and the policy targets full employment. The problem would be solved is employment or unemployment. And why is that? Well, we'll go through why, but when Computer 1.0 crashed, the lesson that was learned was everybody has to get a job all the time, or we're doomed. What does he mean exactly? So, if everybody has to get a job all the time, or we're doomed. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to understand what he's saying. I'm trying to like understand like the general argument or like everybody has to get a job or we're doomed. Uh, if we everybody had to get a job, we wouldn't have CEOs. So, or yeah, so like CEOs don't have jobs; they just own things. So in that instance, I would agree that there was a greater emphasis placed, like a greater like a um, a greater like push and control and like exacerbation and I, some 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 extent on the working class, yeah. But I don't agree that like CEOs and like richer people necessarily had to follow this. I don't understand? I'll, well, he'll explain it. I guess it's a really a lot of reductionism. The Great Depression, fascism, and the turn, to, the turn towards communism in Europe. I, I'm not sure how he's so how do you do this? rephrasing this. the world economy with U.S. dollars. The United States in 1945 is 50% of global trade and 60% of global capital. This is, by the way, and I just want to mention this, this is why the argument the United States needed the periphery because it needed to make those sales is really not what was going on. When you're 60% of world finance and 50% of global trade, what other people are doing is irrelevant. They need you to sell them stuff so that they, they, need, they need to be able to sell stuff to you so you can hold dollars. It's the other way around from what we commonly imagine. It. So how do you do this? You have open current accounts for trade so you can basically sell people stuff and then they can buy things from you and then you can hold, they can hold dollars. But you close off capital accounts. You do not allow finance to do what it wants. There's no big financial markets, there's no derivatives, there's no currency trades. Because again, in the 1920s and 30s, these things were seen to be part of the problem that brought the system down. So you heavily regulate finance. There's a great piece of... So basically, you you decrease the amount of interaction that you allow, like, you allow, uh, you increase, decrease the amount of interaction of, like, uh, like, credit and all that stuff. And basically, if you're... You're trying to create a more sound system. This way, people are depending less on credit and such. I think that's what he's saying. So yeah. Also, full employment. I'm not. Although you could see like people are trying to address, create full employment, but under capitalism, there's always going to be poor people. So like you can never truly like alleviate employment issues. <laughs> in The Economist magazine in 1947 talking about what Bretton Woods was trying to achieve and they had a great line that says what is licensed are things that you can buy, sell and drop on your foot that lead to jobs and expand welfare. Finance doesn't do that and that was very much the thinking of the day. And then the governance in this is quasi-cooperative welfare states rather than minimalist night watchman states. Okay. Because the way that you create full employment is you force capitalists to invest at home because you can't ship your money abroad. So you get a high rate of domestic investment. When you do that, you can and you can insist that you pay high wages and bargain with big labor. If you're on the other side of that trade as business, how do you manage to sustain that? You have to invest a lot in, profitability, in, in uh, productivity. 
because only if you can pay for those wage increases of productivity do you maintain your profit share. Okay. So you get this virtuous circle whereby high demand leads to high wages, which can be paid for by productivity increases, which leads to a high rate of investment, which feeds the whole thing, which only works if you're in a closed economy and you don't let finance play finance games. Okay. The result is rather than heterogeneous, <coughs> homogenous national economies. The economies of the 40s, 50s, and 60s basically looked the same by and large. They made the same stuff. Everybody made cars. Everybody made their own pharmaceuticals. Everybody had big farming subsidies. The EU was simply the consolidation of that on a sort of a slightly bigger scale. It won hmm. Hmm. I would agree that there is a lot more like uh, domestic development in itself, but I don't think that just like global international trade just like was reduced like like um like the US uh heavily invested into western europe uh during this period and they derived a lot of profits of it so like there is a significant domestic development but there is also like a, a like a large amount of international relations and international economies still occurring so i don't think it necessarily like hmm I feel like it's just a little bit reductionist in that it's instance, but I don't think he's necessarily far off the point. Wasn't heterogeneous specialization in global supply chains, which is what you got, although you never call it that, under the first order. Highly restricted financial markets, the domestic correlates of which are COLA contracts, cost of living adjustment contracts, and various forms of corporatism. And what that leads to, as I just said, there is wage-led growth through workers and aggregate demand and fiscal. I mean, sounds pretty based, you know, like, fuck the stock market. <laughs> and, like, having the emphasis as, like, the wage earners being, like, the primary determinants of an economic model, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, it's not perfect, because capitalism sucks, but, like, in terms of, like, comparison between, like, uh, led by uh, corporations itself and through wage-led growth, I, I would say it's pretty good. School policy rather than through profit led growth through firms so very so like unionization even though there's a significant amounts of oppression like racism sexism like systematic ways about that and institutionalized issues with that and so that while it may have like been significantly beneficial for like white especially man um ma uh, male populations it doesn't mean that this, uh, this is extended to everybody. Like, uh, I would agree that having these systems or, like, having these in a capitalist system are kind of like, okay, but at the same time, I would ideally want it to extend it to everybody, not just the, uh, like, the white working population. Different underlying mechanism for how you get growth in the system. High taxes and transfers, which is part of the steering mechanism for keeping that form of capitalism going, and the construction of local economy cartels. Cartels? That is to say, French national champions, British Rail, British Telecom, keeping the commanding heights of industry in sort of democratic control, or at least under the control of national capital. Because okay. that was the steering mechanism to make sure that you got these things working reasonably well. A really interesting thing about this period, nobody knows the name of the person who runs the central bank. Uh, you what? Know, nobody knows who McChesney Martin was, right? It's very important, you do, right, but a few people do. But that was not a, a figure who was important in politics or in the public consciousness. So computer number three is the one we grew up with, right? So from 1980 to 2008, the target's price stability. We'll get to why that. Well, the question we have to ask is, he didn't say why the sec second computer failed. He went over how the, the second computer worked, but he didn't address how it failed because he talked about the first one, but he didn't talk about the second one. Was in a minute. What was the problem? Controlling inflation and restoring the value of capital. I'll get to that in a minute. The mechanism 
maximal global integration and open financial markets. And I'll explain why in a second, just running through this quickly to get to the Controlling inflation, and restoring the value of capital, maxim maximal global integration, open, open financial arguments, globalist, welfare state, and sigilist. That's an interesting word. I will want to him to go over that a little bit, but controlling inflation, restoring the value of capital. So, hmm. we had uh, significant economic crashes throughout this period, and like a uh, Reagan period, uh, the Bush period, uh, Clinton himself, uh, he had significant uh, economic. Uh, success while, during his presidency I think like we we came out of debt in that instance so yeah and then the mechanism maximal global integration so increased yeah yeah so I'll agree with this uh, open financial market so like so pro policy target price stability okay so we had like good price uh, indicators like up until like the 70s really and then from there, once Reagan came into office, it really started screwing us over in terms of the U.S. model. So, like, basically uh, decreasing the buying power of, of like, consumers and decreasing the bargaining power of uh, unions and such. So that's a significant uh, exacerbating factor in that instance. Governance is globalist, welfare state residualist. That is the same. <laughs> multilateral <coughs> agreements up to the WTO, out to the EU, down to the Scottish Parliament. Parliaments basically have given up monetary policy. They govern and compete more effectively over less and less governance. So if you think about the Great Moderation period, what did Parliament in the United Kingdom actually do? They sat around tweeting about who was the most outraged about paedophilia. That was pretty much what the, the role of Parliament was reduced to. What did this look? Again, very much like 1.0. You get this globalization of heterogeneous economies where there's a global division of labor. Open financial markets, flexible labor markets, much lower taxes and transfers. Pro the return of profit-led growth models. It's all about firms making glo global firms and global yeah, profits. Yeah. The end of local economy protections and cartels. No more national champions, privatization of state assets, rundown in the public assets. Okay, and that's bad. one is everybody who knows, everyone who knows the name of the person around the central bank. Because Alan Greenspan became the most important person in, in, in the economy. And the person actually nominally in charge of the treasury, he had no idea what their name was. So I ran through that last one quickly because I'm going to now walk through the mechanisms of each of them. So if you can stay with me on this. There's a little sort of graphic on deflation. Uh. Okay, so he's going to go over the uh, causes of, of them itself, okay. Why it's a problem, because deflation is basically endemic to a gold standard. If every piece of currency has to have metallic backing, your global rate of growth has to be the rate at which you can go mining. So if you have a technological boom, as there were lots of in the 1870s... Alright, sorry, let's start at the top here. Low prices for goods and services deflation. Smaller cash flow and profits for companies, okay. Reduction in production, layoffs, no new hiring, increased unemployment, less spending with, on goods and services, oversupply of goods and services. Lower prices for goods and services. Okay, so deflation is downward spiral. The deflation decreases uh, the amount of money and uh, profits themselves that, that takes away the amount of people are going to be employed, and therefore it's a constant cycle in that instance. Okay. So the 1910s. <laughs> then you can't adjust the money supply. So what has to happen is things become more expensive relative to the mm -hmm. available money supply. <clears throat> it squeezes wage earners. But it also means that to make more profits, what do you have to do? You have to push down on wages. So what happens? Follow it through at any particular point. You've got smaller cash flow and profits for companies. That leads to a reduction in production, leads to increased unemployment. That gives less spending on goods and services. You get to an oversupply of goods and services relative to market demand and then you wait for prices to fall. When prices fall, that sends a signal to business not to do new investment because you're making more, less money than before, and thus it continues. So gold standard arrangements are in inherently deflationary. One might add the EMU arrangements are very similar. So again, the wages are the main channel of adjustment. So when you're stuck in a deflationary spiral, the way that you try to retain your profit share, this is Marx, right? Marx was dead on about this, right? You squeeze labor. That's who basically manage, gets the hit on the system. Now, at a state level, what do you do? And this is what France specialized in in the 1920s. 
is if there's a fixed supply of gold and trade is collapsing and you don't want your economy to do badly, what do you do? You try and steal all the gold. So you get gold hoarding. But when you hoard that gold, it's not actually part of the global money supply. So it makes the problem... Wait, 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 wait. He's getting there. He's, he's almost getting there. Like, he's getting to the argument here that, okay, capitalism bad because it incentivizes corporations to hoard wealth and extract it. Okay. Now, he's going to probably try and say the second bug, second market, second computer itself had a different, significant difference, but I think those same factors are still going to be applying here. <clears throat> it's just having more investments within the economy itself, or not the economy, but the, the workers, and having the unions have been able to bargain. So, like, in that instance, it's the bargaining power of unions and less as, like, the economic, like, the unions themselves are, like, the main driving force. So in that instance, you have the main driving force of the unions being the working class, and the working class, therefore, can drive the value and, like, basically create a more healthy market. Although I'm curious to say how he's going to say that the second market, second bug is going to, a second computer is going to crash. I'd be curious about that. It'll be even worse. <laughs> then they have World War One, which is rather incompatible with openness and trade, to say the least. Okay. And then after the war, you get post-war hyperinflation mm -hmm. because you've had mm -hmm. all of this pent-up demand that's held back by the war. You have an incredibly unequal distribution of income and wealth. You've not had uh, open capital flows for a while. So oh, I mean, there's also um, there's also how like a lot of people died, <laughs> like a lot of people died. So that's going to take away the amount of money available in the economy itself, and you're also going to have like harder um relationships between different nations and different is an interest uh basically well like there's the demand but the companies themselves have also like not been producing towards people's demands have been producing towards uh needed wartime economies so that instance there's going to be other like those those are some factors you can consider too but the minute the war is over basically capital is free to exit damaged economies which crushes the savings that are there and then those currencies collapse so you get massive import inflation in all these economies mm -hmm. which is what decimates eastern europe in the early 1920s okay so the notion that hitler's someone i wrote about in the austerity book if you take the german narrative that basically inflation brought hitler to power the timing's off by about 12 years it's simply not true but it's a good story so what was this there's a story of hitler coming to power because of inflation I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, inflation is going to influence the uh, level of, like, dissent within the uh, German nation itself. There's going to be factors there. But I don't think you can just uh, contribute it to it if inflation is a bit reductionist. Second computer's crash. Well, this was inflation. Because the problem with running these little economies that are closed and cut off forever from the rest of the world uh, and you're pumping capital and forcing a rate of investment is when you run full employment for a very long period of time, the median wage has to get bid up. Now, that's fine so long as you can do productivity improvements. But what if you get to a point where productivity improvements cannot keep pace with the rate of wage that rule of demand? Then you get a negative real return on your investment. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't think it's inflation here that necessarily determined that. I think it's basically uh, decreasing the bargaining power of unions. So, like, basically, uh, se several economics, uh, economic models beca like became instant. Like, uh, I am only educated on the American side, so, like, I can't fully speak to, like, the European side, but you could probably extend this to some extent, because, like, once you look at work on a global trend, then these uh, behaviors can be, like, roughly like connected in itself so like um for example uh, like specifically reagan um he instituted an idea of trickle down economics and he fu fundamentally fought against the unions themselves like and he and like his interests and several like republican presidents and all that stuff basically legislated against unions and decreased their uh active power and from there you like isolate the workers themselves so i think those are as aspects that you're not considering with the argument of inflation the real return on capital so i i would generally disagree with that 
So if inflation becomes persistent in such a system, you destroy the real return on capital. And what that means is, as Mikhail Kalecki pointed out, is you're going to get a capital strike because basically capital will stop investing. Because why would I make a bet now, five years out, I'm going to get 5% if inflation's already 5%. Inflation might be 7%, in which case I'm negative too. I might as well just hoard my cash. So the 97... Well, in that instance, then don't you um, create a... Don't you adjust for inflation then? So, like, you could say, hey, here's the current level of inflation. Like, say there's 5%, right? And if it's going to increase to 10% in five years, then from there you can create a return based on a 10% system. So I don't think that's a... I don't understand. I, although, if you're working like according to workers themselves, how they're going to be like more on a short-term level, then sure. But hmm, I would have to do some more research. That's actually an interesting topic to look on. Is really easily explained by a collapse in investment at a time of full employment and inflation, which of course. So, who's the investment here? If businesses are doing this, then they're going to naturally adjust for inflation because they have enough money to have the adjustment itself. But workers themselves are not going to be able to work for adjustment in inflation. Results in a rise in unemployment at the same time as you have inflation, which is the stagflation theory. What that means is that the old regime, this regime that crashes, the one from 45 to 80, was really great for labor, regardless of what we say about the rest of the world, women, minorities, etc. just in terms of one variable, the wage share. So if you look at GDP as 100, you go to 1945, it's basically 60%, 65% capital, with the residual going to labor. By the time you get to 1973, that's reversed. There's a 12-point gap in the US figures, and it's comparable in the rest of Europe, for basically labor over capital, plus there's inflation in the system. If you're a capitalist, forgive my language, this is a fucking disaster, right? You literally can't do capitalism under those conditions. This is when the wage... Literally can't do capitalism under those conditions? My ma'am, why do I care about capitalists? Why should I care about people that want to fundamentally screw over the workers? Journalist funds in Sweden kicks off. Capital's getting very worried. There's mass labor antagonism. There's hundreds of thousands of strikes everywhere. This is the hot red summers. This is the winter of this. Cool. Good. Workers should fundamentally advocate and fight against capitalists and owners. Because the owners are, in the sense, the antagonist of the labor. That's a problem I'm having, I think, here. The, his arguments are so framed around capitalists and the owners themselves as opposed to economic institution or uh, economic workers like the wage earners i think if you rephrase his if you if you can rephrase the arguments themselves within the context of like wage earners then i would say i would generally be more sympathetic i just don't like this portrayal of the capitalists themselves because in the sense it humanizes them when they are fundamentally the causes of like pretty much all the problems within an economy like, and sure, you can make that make it the shade that say that's production is because you have to look at other factors and you know like they're they are a significant driver in the economy itself. Sure, but fundamentally, the core backbone of economies are wage earners, and they are the people who primarily drive that. So I would say, and in response to that, they are the the people that need to have the primary focus because often labor movements and in terms of like historical representation are going to be shown so often shown as like an antagonist <coughs> sorry sorry about that they're going to be shown as antagonist or even just like the issue in itself and i don't like that because i feel like that is an attempt to like delegitimize the actual experiences and needs of wagers content workers get too empowered and because of that shift in the capital labor ratio, capital revolts. And that's what we see. So to go back to the computer analogy, there's your hardware reset. Independent central banks. You we almost had it. I mean, we wouldn't actually have had communism itself. But, you know, like, make the capitalists fail. <laughs> Although, like, people suffering at the same time. Yeah, and it's complicated.
basically take that bit of the computer and say, no, no, you don't get to play with that anymore. Because you will always pander to Labour. You will increase their wage share because that's where the votes are. But you need us. Now, the whole point of wage earners funds was, actually, we don't need you. We can do this entirely without you. Which challenges not just the rate of return, but their right to exist. Which is why the politics of this period got very fundamental. So if you think about the birth of neoliberal politics, private... Wait, wait, let's go back. Let's, let's wind that back. Piece ...their wage share, because that's where the votes are. But you need us. Now, the whole point of wage earners funds was, actually, we don't need you. We can do this entirely without you. Hell Which yeah. The challenge is not just the rate of return, but... Based. This man. Okay. He, he ain't perfect, but he pretty nice. That beard. The right to exist. Which is why the politics of this period got very fundamental. So if you think about the birth of neoliberal politics, privatize, integrate, liberalize, globalize, it was certainly about taking the steam out of labor markets, reducing labor's power, attacking trade unions, dismantling labor protection, because that destroys the inflationary forces that hit the real return on capital. But it's also a massive software reset for a highly reconfigured form of capitalism, which is now going global through supply chains, which is running along the IT revolution, which is letting capital be free for the first time in 60 years so it can find its highest rate of return. And if you do what Paul Volcker did, the chairman of the Federal Reserve back in 8081, he jacks up interest rates to 16%. Well, what does that mean? It means the economy was crushing recession for 18 months. But then what happens is you're liberalizing finance and there's been a lot of inflation in the system. So two things to think about. If you're a baby boomer, God bless you, and you bought a house in the 1970s with a 5% mortgage over 30 years and inflation went to 15%. The bank just paid half of your house off. It was a brilliant time to be a debtor and a shit time to be a creditor, hence capital's revolt, right? But what happens when Volcker does the shock is that position changes. Inflation falls really rapidly, but you've still got very high interest rates. So this is the era of Wall Street. This is the era of greed is good. Because you were getting 7 8% for showing up at Citibank to open up a savings account in a time when inflation was falling, but interest rates were staying high. So finance became unbelievably profitable. And you have a huge pent-up demand for credit because you haven't had access to credit in any meaningful sense for over 30 years. So everybody suddenly wants a credit card. Everybody can get a mortgage. And the greatest trick the banks ever played on us was to call their assets assets because they're not. They're everybody else's liabilities. So Ooh, advanced, I like this. I like this man. All right. Okay. Okay. He ain't bad. He ain't bad. He. Here, I'm just gonna. Okay. Send it for this man just a little bit because he's making hella good arguments. I like these arguments. Lending money to all of us in different forms hoping that they get some of it back. And the incentive is to run down their capital reserves so that they can lend even more and increase the leverage in the system, which makes the system as a whole fragile. And that was the bug that crashed 2.0. Because basically you end up with a huge amount of debt, forget Nash, forget government debt, that wasn't a problem, it's private sector debt, through leverage in the banking system and a huge build up in inequality. So the build-up in inequality demands that you borrow more against your future. And that's perfectly reasonable so long as you expect your future to have higher wages than in the past. But what happens if you enter a period of wage stagnation, which you're going to get in this system because there's no way for labor to push on and claim a higher share of national income? Then you're just taking on debts on top of debts. Now, if you're a banker and you know that the wages aren't going to rise, but you've got all those debts out there, which you call assets, which are really liabilities, how do you keep that liquid? You do what Minsky called Ponzi finance. You throw more money after it. So you get to the period in 2004, 2005, when you opened your door and you couldn't come in because there were credit card offers all over the floor, where everybody was treating their house as a HELOC. They were basically using it as a financial asset rather than a place to live. So mm. that system had to crash. These numbers, by the way, if you have a look up there, this is how big bank leverage the GDP got. So Iceland, like, I, have you been to Iceland? It's lovely, it's one town with like 150,000 people in it and the rest of the country is 150,000 people. They had uh, 8.5 billion in GDP and 10 times that in bank assets. Right? The Brits had 400% of GDP when you add up those numbers. Even the Germans, Deutsche Bank, 86% of GDP in one bank. 
which on an average Tuesday ran operational leverage of 66 to 1, which basically meant they had a 2% asset cushion for all the stuff they had out there, which meant a 2% turn against their loan book meant they were insolvent and thus would destroy the German state. Right? So what the Allies didn't manage in World War II, Deutsche Bank could have pulled off in an average Tuesday. So this is an incredibly tightly coupled, globalized, highly levered financial system. Now, in, two, in the 1970s, when it wasn't working for capital, there was a political revolution. There was a system reset, a hardware rewrite, and a hardware modification. This time around, there was no such thing. Because the hardware mod, sending it to the central banks, what did we do? We said, hey, central bankers, please save us. Now, their whole thing is, we don't do inflation. Their whole thing is, we're the guardians of sound money. But they also are the clients of the financial sector. So when they discovered that the entire thing was going to go down, they used public finances to basically bloat their balance sheet. Those blue lines are basically all the shit on the bank's balance sheets that they were going to go to zero. And oh, hi there, uh, Kira. So uh, right now, um, I had a friend uh, link me a video. So basically, it's talking about a brief... Uh, it's talking about uh, economic models as how they developed, and I was just providing some commentary. As pretty much, I think I'm going to be finishing with this soon. But basically, talking about the issues of like how, uh, like uh, for example, like he was talking about uh, different systems. Like we were talking about like 1880 to 1910, then 19 like 20 to like 1945, 1945. All basically talking about how different driving forces and how they've worked themselves. Like, if you're talking about, like, the 2008 market crash, and then talking about uh, 1945 to Cold War era. So, different instances and how they themselves had their respective issues. And it's, like, basically the framing of labor versus, like, capital uh, capitalist owners. He's not a communist, but he has some good arguments, and I think they're pretty effective. And I was just going over it, reviewing it, just learning a little bit more. You know, just doing the good stuff. How you doing? Hey, it's fine. I'm too dumb for this too, but I'm watching it anyways. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be over soon. Uh, be hopping on to Stardew Valley soon enough. And crush them. And you take it out and you swap it for loans and you cover it up with lots of fancy names and acronyms, but essentially that's liquidity support for the banking sector. Federal Reserve, Euro system, through the whole crisis. Period. Yeah. So there's no system reset. Okay. No hardware mod this time. Yeah. And the problem with that is you create a pressure cooker. Because what you've had underlying all this is this lack of wage growth. How has streaming been going for me thus far? Um, I have not had a whole lot of viewers in itself, but it's fun. I just, you know, I'm trying to, like, consistently stream and eventually get the algorithm to favor, favor me at this point. Uh, I've had pr I had one instance where I had a raid by a significant streamer, but that was the only, like, significant thing in that instance. The rest has just been, like, uh, live, live viewers like minimal, but like, like twenty max of like viewers afterwards. Yeah, I had a decent raid. Uh, it got me up to a couple followers, but not enough to go to affiliate yet. So like, it's just a process, and it's really frustrating. So you know, like if you have friends, you want to like say like, hey, come watch this stupid American talk about politics and gaming and be bad at games. You can go ahead and invite them if you want. <laughs> huge build-up in private sector debt, a massive amount of fragility in a system whereby capital has the whip hand and labor has no right and no skill and no bargaining okay. power. Think Anderson's book for the reading book. Come on, I know you got some friends. Don't you talk about your friend to yourself like that. What do you consider all the people in the Discord, right? Like, are those not your friends? I know you and your personal life a little bit. You got friends. Don't you hate on yourself. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. But I like, eh. You know, like... Yeah, I get you, I get you. Yeah. Just, I'm just trying to get myself more involved in debates and all that stuff and just get more views and draw in more views. Like, say, like, hey, here's a person who brings up decent points. Come watch them, basically. <laughs> that's basically what I'm trying to do right now. 
happens at Wolf Hunt. And plus, it's only the second week of streaming, so you know. So, this acts as a giant volatility constraint. There's no system reset. And the okay. problem with volatility constraints is eventually the Steam has to come out. Yeah. So, there's no new software written. There's none installed because what we have is incompatible with the reality that we actually live with. This causes a decade-long recession in Southern Europe, massive wage stagnation, continuing wage stagnation in the United States. Yeah. You rack up very, very high debts into the system. And populists are essentially shitty code writers. They're trying to write new forms of software. Think about all the Bitcoin enthusiasts. What are they trying to do? They know they can't actually mod the hardware, but they can do a hack which writes new software, which allows them to bypass all this bullshit. So there's a fee. Well, I don't like this necessarily like equation of populists like if you're talking about like communists and stuff sure like communists themselves are like basically trying to create an entirely new system but like if you're talking about like democratic socialists yeah like democratic socialists are working within the failed system so yeah it's pretty bad feeling that they know the system's wrong there's something deeply wrong with our institutions oh what happened in 2008 all right, if you want to go to this complicated factor, okay. So basically is, if you uh, look at the 1920s, right, uh, it's a failed system of credit. What happens is an entirely inflationary system that had no real backing to it. So in this instance, it was significantly a portion of the housing market, at least in the U.S. So the U.S. themselves, so the U.S. themselves, uh, they had like uh, the people who like own homes and stuff, right? And what happens is they would uh, allow people to purchase or like rent uh, mortgage homes on credit. And from there, uh, since those people are able to get into those homes who would necessarily be able to afford them, then they were able to, they got into those homes. But in order to uh, pay for like different products and items, they would have to work on a credit system of like liquid, uh, of, like uh, basically put it like putting their house as an, a financial stake in that instance is it became like a revolving relationship it's like a bubble where to an extent uh, the people who owned homes and like different people that were running out or like mortgaging out homes uh, they basically were giving each other like they were buying and selling and there were significant amounts of debts but that had no real value to them in that instance is there's no real value comparatively so basically at a certain point the system itself couldn't sustain this no value trading and buying and sharing in that instance eventually it just crashed because once you start having the debts being pulled then so like for example in the stock market itself eventually people tried to like collect debts and from there, those people couldn't pay off debts. Well, th those people couldn't pay off debts, so they tried to take debts from other people. Those people couldn't pay off debts. And it's just a, an entire cycle, entire system of people unable to pay debts, and therefore they're going into, like, bankruptcy. And it's a, an entire, like, like a, an entire pyramid of artificial uh, buying and selling that has no real backing to it. And so that instance, it failed, and that's what the issue came in. So all those relationships came into... Uh, fruition and that's how the like the crash happened <laughs> that's that's how i understand it roughly um it's fine i don't really know too much about economics myself it's just like there are like core understandings i have and i'm looking to expand my knowledge over time so i look i'm a a polit political science person so i understand a lot of the politics behind things i understand how some relations of politics and economics but trust me i couldn't go into like the deep complicated statistics and all that stuff trust me i am not that good i just fundamentally have my core beliefs and i fundamentally want to maximize people's lives and make them as happy as possible in that instance capitalism is a fundamental antagonist to people's happiness so, you know. And we're going to attempt to basically write new codes to get around it. So if you define the problem as immigration, migrants, cultural difference, you write one type of code. If you're a left populist, you write a different type of code. So I, I, mm, I, don't, mm, I don't like him framing uh, types of people as, I mean... Yeah, I mean, they fundamentally come from the same issue. It's just, like, I don't like equating 
like my political movements like the left versus like either the right or the center or anything because i feel like fundamentally there are different levels of reality like they all recognize that there's an issue in itself it's just interpreting how that exists issue it exists and how to resolve that issue well this is a volatility concern that produces an angry politics so let me explain why in more detail there's a very famous did i do the first one did i skip one there no i didn't all right i'll do this one first all right um what things cost so this is basically how markets view inflation so basically two percent this is the crisis two percent one percent two percent just under two percent 2018. that's nothing right it's absolutely nothing here's american costs uh everything has gone up by 40 percent over the more or less two periods in 2001. medical care has gone up eight my profile page um Okay, okay, so, long story. So there's this, uh, there's this uh, really nerdy tale. It's called the, yeah, 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 yeah. So basically is uh, Call of Cthulhu. There are, uh, so there's a, a thing called like a, a like a D&D green text. And what happens is there's these uh, famous stories and one of them, it talks about the tales of old man Henderson. What happens is it was a, uh, it was a game of Call of Cthulhu where the DM was absolutely crap. Like, he had just killed character characters right he, here and there, just, like, insanely. And in that instance, um, he was also being, like, abusive as a DM. And so what happens is instead of those people, like, leave, leaving on a healthy level, there's this guy who decided to create an entirely insane react, uh, reactions. And... If I could just find it, I could link it to you. But basically, Old Man Henderson is like the result of this crazy, this uh, crazed process. Old Man Henderson. All right, here. Let's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what happens is Old Man Henderson existed, and he was just basically a means of spite against the DM itself. Yeah, you know, but you know, like, uh, I like my old man Henderson. Let me just drop this in for you. There you go. You can read that on your own time. But, no problem. Basically, old man Henderson is glorious, and when I made my Discord, I had to choose a profile page. And then from there... I was like, what do I want? And then I just chose that. And I've just kind of stuck with it forever. Hey, Psycho! Psycho Arigato! <laughs> but basically, yeah. Uh, that's just kind of like the deep nerd lore that comes from it. And then eventually I had uh, Ghastly. You know, um, I don't want to drop their actual name. I don't want to uh, dox them. So, yeah. So after that, I, uh, I asked them to make it like a pansexual flag backing behind it and then it's just like you know that's just kind of how it existed and unfortunately i don't have it as my current discord profile but um i have it everywhere else so that's kind of how that works yeah yeah uh hey psycho i've been watching a very complicated economics thing i think at this point i am good on it i think this guy is pretty based for the most part, but he's not perfect. I'm going to give him a like because I think he deserves it. But in the meantime... Alright, alright. Well, uh, I have two viewers now. Woo! Okay. Now, if you'll give me, like, quick two minutes, uh, I'm going to grab some more food. So just give me, like, two minutes. I'll be right back. <laughs> 